Thank you all. Dang, it's a heck of a crowd. It is indeed, sir. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, Mr. President, if I may, let me just explain to our audience here and watching on live stream. As some of you know, we were anticipating that President Zelensky was going to join us for this conversation. And because of the barbaric attack yesterday by Russia, the largest attack on Ukrainian infrastructure, President Zelensky understandably has to deal with matters at home and regrets very much that he's not able to join the conversation with you, sir, and with all of you here. Um, but uh, plan A was to have a conversation with you and President Zelensky. Plan B is you and I are gonna have a conversation, but, but, but. Plan B. Well, but, but for most organizations, <laughs> Hold on, let me dig out of the hole. Um, <laughs> plan B would be plan A plus for most organizations. Oh, well, thank you, Dave. Yes. <laughs> you gotta let me finish, you gotta let okay, me finish. Good, yeah, a yeah. little slow. I, anyway. I uh, was, thank you. Laura and I are thrilled, uh, A, that we work together, uh, and B, that you all are here, and that you give a dang about freedom uh, and how other people live, and that's, uh, that's really the topic. Do we, should we care in America about whether or not people uh, can live in a free and peaceful society? And the answer at the Bush Center is a resounding absolutely. And you'll hear from people today who are dissidents who uh, need our support and help. So let, let's focus on Ukraine first. Okay. Uh, that's where we were going to start if we had President Zelensky with us. Uh, your take on the, on the latest situation there. Ukraine seems to be on, on the march, but yesterday was a bad day. Yeah, you know, every day's a bad day if you live in Ukraine. I mean, this was a, a, a peaceful democracy that was growing its institutions, and uh, and its neighbor decides that uh, Russia should own it. Uh, and uh, from that moment forward, uh, the people of Ukraine have suffered mightily. The thing that uh, is instructive to the American people, or should be, is how brave the Ukrainian people are and how they refuse to be conquered by its neighbor. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, there's gonna be more atrocity. The question is will the Ukrainian people continue to show the bravery they've shown. And that's why I'm, I'm so sad that President Zelensky couldn't join us because he's a tough dude. And uh, he, he is, uh, he, he's gonna hang in there. And so long as he gets the support needed, you and he did a Zoom a few months ago in the spring, and uh, you referred to him as the Winston Churchill of our time. Correct. What did you mean by that? I thought it was quite profound. Uh, <laughs> wasn't bad. I hope he took it as a compliment, <laughs> because I, I'm a huge Winston Churchill uh, believer. I think Winston Churchill was one of the great leaders. And, you know, I spent a fair amount of time studying the, the London Blitz and watched a leader help will a people through this very dark period. And that's what Zelensky's doing. I mean, there's no darker period than to have a bully on your border willing to bomb innocent people and destroy infrastructure and force people to live in the cold. And yet here's a leader that is defiant uh, for the good of his people. And uh, uh, other than the fact that Churchill never wore t-shirts, they had a they had the for same. For good reason, I yeah, think. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, he shows the same amount of courage. Yep. And history's, history will judge him, you know, as a remarkable leader, I think. Well, we certainly send our very best to him and we the do. Ukrainian people through these very difficult times. Um, Mr. President, there, there are some Americans uh, who wonder why should we support Ukraine? Sure, uh, and that's always been the case in our country. Uh, there's kind of an isolationist uh, tendency at times to say, you know, we've got our own problems, let others solve it. It's kind of like the pushback we got on uh, HIV AIDS, PEPFAR, you know, there's a whole generation of people dying on the continent of Africa, and there were some in our country saying that, why do we want to spend money on total strangers? And one answer is because that's who we are. We're generous, decent people that care about the human condition elsewhere. We recognize we can't solve all world problems, but we certainly can deal with the big ones. And there's no bigger problem than to have a young democracy bullied by its neighbor, by an autocrat. And we should care about uh, 
the human condition elsewhere. And we should care about whether or not this young democracy survives because it's in our, it's in our national interest. It's not only in the moral interest, in our national interest, because, and here's what the American people have got to think about. What will Europe look like 10 years from now if Putin conquers Ukraine? The whole strategic balance of Europe shifts dramatically. And by the way, next would be the Baltics. Mm -hmm. uh, with whom we've got an alliance called NATO. And uh, the whole trading regime of the United States and Europe shifts dramatically. So it affects us economically. So not only does it affect us uh, spiritually as a nation that believes in freedom, it, if, if you, Putin prevails, it affects us uh, from a national security perspective and an economic perspective. And this is a very important issue. And, you know, I know there's voices saying, well, we can spend money elsewhere and do this and that. But listen, our government spent a lot of money, uh, which, by the way, is frankly a big issue as to whether or not we're going to be able to solve our debt. But the uh, amount of money going to Ukraine is small compared to how much money we're spending elsewhere. And yet the consequences for failure are significant, not only for the Ukrainian people, but for our own country. And so, yeah, I... I we're big believers in Ukrainian freedom here at the Bush Center, as are you. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned PEPFAR, and I'm going to go off the track of freedom, although it's actually related. Um, next year marks the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR. Correct. You will be recognized December 1st, World AIDS Day, by the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. We will have an event in Washington next February. It has saved an estimated over 21 million lives. All right. Can you just explain for this audience? Because it, it is related to freedom. It helps stabilize countries so that they don't become vulnerable to extremist forces. Correct. But your vision behind it. Well, my vision was we're all God's children. Every life is precious. And there was a pandemic destroying an entire generation of people on the continent of Africa. And we're the greatest, most generous nation ever. And if we sat on our... Uh, uh, behinds. Uh, La laurels, laurels. Huh? Our, la our laurels. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> trying to clean it up. It's kind of hard to sit on laurels. Anyway, yeah. uh, <laughs> you didn't say Laura, did you? I t <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was nice working here. I'm going <laughs> to leave now. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no, it's a, uh, you know, it's a very, and you mentioned this award. I don't want any awards. I've had the biggest award there is, being President of the United States, but I'm going for one reason, because I want to remind Congress this is a program that actually worked. We set clear goals, measurable goals, and we continue to measure the goals, and therefore their money being spent is effectively being spent, and that's why we're going, is to help, uh, and, but the people who deserve the credit are the American people. They funded the program, except they have no idea what we're talking about, and, uh, uh, and so I to the extent that we're going to talk about it in Washington, uh, we'll hopefully remind people about the, the generous nature of our country and the impact we can have on, on dealing with big issues. No bigger issue than helping uh, dissidents and people locked in political prisons know that there are people who care about them and uh, that we hear their voices. And that's what this conference is about today. The Freedom ad Agenda defined much of your presidency. The, your second inaugural speech was devoted to it. Um, nearly two decades later, how do you see things? Well, one reason, uh, I, so the attacks on 9-11 really were, were, were an ideological attack. It was those who uh, have a dark vision of the world versus those of us who believe in light. And I say light, that's the, the uh, recognizing the universal desire for people to live in freedom. It's not an American gift. It's, I, I happen to believe it's an almighty's gift to the world. Uh, and, uh, and so it was, a, if you're dealing with an ideological conflict, which I felt we were then and I still feel we are, the ultimate outcome de determines uh, how people live. And therefore I felt in order to extinguish the ideology of extremism that we ought to help others realize the blessings of freedom. And it was controversial, David. I, I, I couldn't believe it was controversial, but it was. How dare you impose your values, people would say, all around the world. Uh, and kind of in justification for those who squashed people's rights. Uh, but I was, uh, I was determined that this country would send out a message that uh, if you live in darkness, we're going to try to help you. And uh, 
look, it's happening in Iran right now. People are desperate to live in a free society, and you're beginning to see people take risk on the streets. I think you're going to hear from an Iranian today, yes. an Iranian-American today, about what's happening. And the question is, should we care as a country? And the answer is absolutely we should care, not only for the sake of peace in the Middle East, but for the sake of the people struggling against autocracy. And uh, it's... Uh, and so part of our mission here is to help make sure Americans don't uh, get so comfortable in this free society that they forget about others. In this struggle of democracy versus authoritarianism, you were just touching on this. What, what is at stake? And is that the right way to look at this? It's between democracy and authoritarianism? I think it's between freedom and human condition and human rights versus authoritarian government that doesn't grant those. Uh, democracy tends to yield human dignity and human rights better than any other system. But I believe if it needs to be put in a personal connection. I mean, you're going to hear from a, a, a person whose mother is locked in a Uyghur prison camp. Uh, you know, we can argue forms of government, but what we ought, we ought to be focusing on is whether or not we can help people who are locked aside in one of the largest labor camps, prison camps in the history of mankind. I don't know if Joseph Kim is speaking today, but he works here for a North Korean escapee. And uh, this guy, uh, Kim Jong-un, has got the largest prison camps, even bigger than the Uyghurs in the history of mankind. And so should we, I know we can argue forms of government, but initially it is whether or not, uh, you know, the, the Joseph Kims of the world should be listened to and heard. And uh, anyway, that's what we're doing. Yeah, it's a... Uh, Again, I'm just concerned about isolationism uh, in our country, basically saying, who gives a damn? And the Bush Center, our message is, we give a damn, loud and clear. <laughs> Sir, when you were president, you made a, a real point of meeting with activists and dissidents, former political prisoners, human rights advocates. Why? Why was that so important to you? And what, what did you get from those meetings? Well, first of all, I'm doing the same thing today. Yep, you met with them earlier. Yeah. Absolutely. Even though I'm kind of about to pasture. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it sent a signal around the world that the U.S. president cared. Yep. And so I was interested in, uh, I remember, I remember uh, uh, Natan Sharansky wrote a great book called The Case of Democracy. He was a political prisoner, and he told me what it was like to hear Ronald Reagan's voice. And I said, wow, you know, I'm going to try to lend my voice. And, uh, you know, you just don't know when you're the U.S. president how far your voice can travel. But I guess pretty far. And so meeting with these dissidents and political prisoners uh, elevated their status. And, you know, hopefully a political prisoner noted that the U.S. president was meeting with a political prisoner who had just gotten out of the same prison. And plus, there are some amazing people. I mean, it just it, it invigorated me and Laura to get to know Václav Havel, for example. I mean, this guy was like Mr. Courage. Yep. And the world can be short of courage. Uh, but, but to highlight courage also maybe encourages other people. And the other thing I didn't do was meet with the, the, the thugs that were ruining these countries. Uh, well, I wouldn't meet with Putin. I did meet him alone as president. But anyway, he changed. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, like Hugo Chavez, you'll hear from a Venezuelan dissident today. I wouldn't meet with him because I didn't want to lend our great status as the, as the beacon of freedom to, uh, you know, honoring an autocrat. And, uh, uh, you know, some people disagree with that position. Uh, no. But when I did meet with, uh, like, the Chinese leaders, uh, I always talked about the need to have freedom of religion. And I didn't do it to embarrass them. I just did it to remind them if they had had freed religion in their country, their country would be better off, particularly when it came to helping a neighbor in need. We went to church. Laura and I went to church. We were going to go to underground church, but the minute the president shows up, it's not underground anymore. <laughs> uh, but we, we went to a church. It, it, you know, it might have been kind of a fake church, I guess. But we went, sending a signal to religious dissidents within China and around the world that the American president cares. So I, I spent a lot of time doing that, Dave, and it... Uh, it, it, I, I became a better person from doing it. If I can, Mr. President, I, I told you this the other day. Um, in September 2008, I was working in your State Department, and we were in New York 
on the margins of the UN General Assembly, and you had just met with a group of activists and former political prisoners. Right, I remember prisoners. Didn't we have a picture by Ellis Island or something? Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, I met with uh, we'll get, one from Belarus yeah. Yeah. Uh, immediately after. He was in tears because the President of the United States showed interest in his welfare and what was happening in his country. So it, you're absolutely right, it has enormous impact. Yeah, well, I wish uh, things had changed, but they didn't. It is worse in Belarus, unfortunately. But it's even worse than when he was there? It, it is. Yeah. I mean, Luk Lukashenko. can become a satellite yeah. of Russia here pretty quick. He stole the election in August 2020, but his days are numbered, I think. Um, Good. You know, I love an optimist. <laughs> Why? I, one of the reasons I'm here. Um, so the question is Putin Day's number. Really the question, and I think uh, 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 the Ukrainian policy for the United States has got to be pretty stark, and that is we hang with them until they win. And then the question is, can they win? Absolutely they can win. They're winning. But they won't win if the United States and the free world says it's not worth it anymore, or we're too cold. Let's stop supporting, let's stop uh, backing Zelensky. Or let's cut a deal. Uh, Zelensky, if he were here, and I, I would ask him, do you think there's a deal to be made? He'd say no. <laughs> he might put out some you know, fig leaf or something. But the idea of saying, okay, now that Putin has destroyed our country, let's cut a deal with him. You can have a third of our country is not going to happen. E either that or he's not the Winston Churchill of the modern era. And, uh, and so the United States has got to hang in there. And we've got to recognize the man can win. And the minute Russia gets driven out of Ukraine, uh, the, uh, the strong man Putin doesn't look so strong, does he? And the Russian people begin to question whether or not he's the right person to lead their country. And so uh, I can't tell you how important this issue is for us right now. It's the expression, I think, that these regimes seem stable until they're not. Yeah, exactly. You never know what the tipping point is, but it takes heroic, brave activists and average citizens to exactly. stand up to them exactly. with our support and, and help. Absolutely. Um, as you know, Mr. President, there are some Americans who say, we've got enough problems in our own country, none of our business, um, far away, why should we worry? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, if it's an uh, expenditure of money, just analyze the amount of money it will take to keep Ukraine free versus how much we're spending. <laughs> it's not very much. Uh, PEPFAR was like, I forgot, like 0.2% of the budget or some ridiculously small amount of money, and yet the impact was huge. And it would be the same in Ukraine. And so uh, it, it's not going to break our budget to support the Ukrainians. Uh, and the reason why is, is because failure in Ukraine will uh, affect future generations of Americans. An unstable Europe a Europe in which a tyrant is on the march is going to affect our national security. And the question is, uh, shouldn't we be thinking about a future generation of Americans leaving behind something better? And so the, an isolationist America makes the world much more dangerous. It, this is the kind of statement that irritated some people around the world. But if the United States does not lead, the world will not follow. <laughs> If the United States doesn't keep the lead on Ukraine, it's less likely the European nations will want to support the Ukrainians. And so our leadership is indispensable for collective action against autocracy. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, here's the problem. It's hard to project. Uh, it's hard to think about what the world will look like if, if the Ukrainians fail. Most Americans are trying to pay bills, you know, trying to worry about inflation. They don't think about those terms. And that's why this conference is important. It's why it's important to try to affect policy in Washington, D.C., so that the policymakers think long term on behalf of the American people. And, Mr. President, I'll also mention that as a follow on to this conference, we're going to launch a new series of profiles of activists, political prisoners, to make sure we shine a spotlight on them to make sure the world remembers their situation. As you said, just for political prisoners, just knowing people are paying attention yeah, yeah. can mean the world. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I repeat, Natan Shirovsky is one of the most influential books in my presidency, The Case for Democracy. This guy, you know, he's a courageous man. And uh, to hear him talk is, is, is uh, it's a marvel to think that he came out of that Soviet gulag as intact as he did yeah. and as anxious as he is to help others, free others. And so, uh, yeah, people, you, you'll be inspired by the stories here. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's let's go back to the basics. Basics? Yeah. Why does why does freedom matter? What why should we care? You covered this a little bit, but I, I just want to dig a little deeper. Why should we care about the human rights situation for Burmese, for yeah. Egyptians, for Cubans, Venezuelans, Sudanese? The list sadly goes on. Well, on. ultimately, dem democratic states yield peace. If you study the history of the world, democracies don't war because people decide the fate of their government. And uh, if you get, you know, I say, do you want war? Most people say no. Uh, you know, I like to cite the example of South Korea. Uh, mm -hmm. I gave a speech one time uh, to like, I don't know, 20,000 Christians. The Billy Graham of Korea asked me to speak there, a guy named Billy Kim. And the reason he's called the Billy Graham is because he interpreted Billy Graham's famous speech in South Korea right after the Catholic, right after the Korean conflict ended, not in peace, but in an armistice, by the way. In other words, the war has never ended. And uh, I, you know what I thought about there? I thought about Harry Truman. I said, wow, I wish Harry Truman could see this. Here's a guy who had faith in the capacity for people to self-govern and that democracy would help yield peace. And there are 50,000 Christians willingly gathering to listen to, you know, George W. Bush. And uh, uh, I thought about uh, the people who sacrificed their life, the families of Korean veterans. Wow, I wish they could see this and realize that the sacrifice actually meant something. I thought about the Korean people there, they, you know, like what would their life be like? Had there not been a willingness to help this country realize a free society, they'd been living in the same society that Joseph Kim lived in, which is gulags and deification of a person. Uh, and then, I, you know, I thought about our American people. I hope they understand that by hanging in there and keeping troops there and able to let this democracy survive, that it yielded peace in the Far East. A lot of presidents before me had to deal with war in the Far East. I never had to worry about it because democracies yield peace. Not every country in the Far East is a democracy, obviously, but it, China's surrounded by democracies. And uh, anyway, that's why Americans ought to think about it. Yep. Uh, and I, I repeat, Dave, it's, it's the long-term consequences of freedom. Yield peace. Yep. And it takes a lot of hard work, and it takes a lot of patience, and it's not going to happen instantly. But it's not going to happen at all if, the American peop if America turns its back on people seeking a better life. Yes, sir. I mean, the democratic peace theory, democracies don't go to war with each other. That's it, yeah. Did I think of that or you? Um, I'm going to go with you. Thank you. Um, That's smart. Y yes, it is. I'm only in my fifth week in this new role, yeah. so I'd like to... Uh, and we're lucky you're here, well, I might add. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, I, I want to bring up one other argument that we often hear, which is we have other interests in some of these countries, uh, trade, security, energy. The, those sometimes overshadow the human rights issues and concerns that we have. How, how do we strike that? It right doesn't out? have to. Yeah. I mean, you can be both a human rights activist and somebody worried about war in the Middle East and trying to work with, uh, you know, countries to prevent war from happening. You can be worried about the human condition, but you can also be working with countries that may not uh, be as open a society as we are to help prevent the Iranians from marching willy-nilly throughout the Middle East. And so there's, there's ways to balance that. But the key thing is to always keep freedom and democracy forefront in your mind. And the other thing that's really important is, is that you can gain a lot of, you know, kudos by hectoring leaders about, you know, their, their human condition in their countries, but they're not going to listen to you. I didn't like it when people hectored me. And, uh, uh, and so I, I think the best policy is for a U.S. president and the people working with him to keep freedom in the forefront of the strategy, but also never embarrass your host and never try to gain, you know, credibility with the newspapers. And, oh, man, isn't this guy marvelous? But all of a sudden, you get shut out from any uh, advancement of the free societies. You know, I was a big Arab Spring guy. Mm -hmm. I thought it was inevitable. I thought it was a great moment. People rising up and say, we want to live in a free society. And it created turmoil and chaos, no question about that. On the other hand, it, it, to me, it verified my belief that people want to live in a free society. 
And, you know, some in our country say oh, Muslims don't want to be free. And I say, yeah, that's interesting. We said that about black people in America for too damn long. And so, yeah, there's kind of an arrogance to living in a free society and saying others can't realize the blessings of freedom. We disagree with that here at the Bush Center. Yes, sir. Um, we live in polarized times. Yes, we do. But is this issue supporting freedom? This is an issue, it seems, that Republicans and Democrats can and should agree on. I'd hope so. I'd hope so. I suspect that the extremes of both parties, there are people who say, you know, it's not worth it. Uh, but I would hope it's the kind of issue that uh, people can come together. It seems like to me members of Congress in both parties are hanging in there with Ukraine. I hope so. Uh, I repeat, all they got to do is look how much money they're spending elsewhere and say, well, a little bit of it should go to Ukraine at least for the sake of peace. Uh, but it seems like it, Dave, I, you know. Uh, I hope so. I mean, I'm, I'm a loyal Republican, and I'm going to keep my voice out there regardless of what other Republicans say. Well, Mr. President, um, if I needed any, which I didn't, um, this conversation has been reaffirmation of why I'm so proud to be here. It's an honor Thanks, to serve Dave. here at the Institute. Thank you all for your interest. Absolutely. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Bush, too. Um, just tremendous on, on these issues. Not a way to work her in there. <laughs> well, I had to recover from earlier. Yeah, that's so, right. Um, Very deft. You didn't, you didn't exactly help me out there before. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> It's um, going to be a good conference today. It's a great conference. We, we still have a lot, a lot to cover. The, the activists, are, I think, are next, if I remember the schedule. And uh, we will have a panel talking about what the U.S. can do to help. And we're going to end it, actually, on an interesting note about sports and human rights. Uh, we have Joey Cheek here to talk about yeah, the Yeah, I saw Joey earlier. Took. Exactly. Nobody's ever heard of the guy. But anyway, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Joey, don't leave. Don't leave. <laughs> He's an Olympic athlete. He is, indeed who got burned because of his support uh, in Darfur. Yep, he took a brave and, stand. Yeah, he did. And we're, we're we proud to have him. We need more brave stands. We do indeed. I'll tell you something you don't know about Joey. He's got a two-year-old child. I actually knew that, but go ahead. <laughs> well, you're supposed to say. I, 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 right, I mean, uh, yes, right, sorry. I'm glad you. We'll, we'll work on yeah, this. I'm glad yeah. you brought that to my attention. Who else you got? Uh, time. We have Alice Albright, the Alice president. Alice Albright, his mother. Is a, yep. You know, I painted her mother. No, nah, that's right. Uh, my book, book on yep, immigrants? Yep, exactly. Uh, the reason I did is because, A, she's a courageous, smart woman, but I also painted Henry Kissinger. Think about this. Two Jews escaping Nazism and communism, in Madeleine Albright's case, come to our country with basically nothing and end up being secretaries of state. It's an awesome country yes. where people can come and realize those kinds of dreams. <laughs> We're glad she's here. Thank, thank you for inviting her. Uh, Give me a chance to pitch my book. Uh, <laughs> well, and also MCC happened under your administration. It did, yeah. She'll Millennium talk about Challenge that. Corporation. And, yeah. and the 20th anniversary, Alice, I think is coming up in 2024, so we'll look to bring more attention to that. You look at PEPFAR, you look at uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation, life-saving programs that also insist on accountability, data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not just throwing money, it's making sure the money is used effectively and wisely, and it is life-changing. Yeah, thank you, yeah, well, anyway, uh, you got any other way to burn time, or should we get off the stage? Uh, probably safer if we get off the stage. Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard the latest one about Oh, yeah, no, it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> thank Mrs. you. Mrs. Bush, help. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's, a, it's an honor to be up here with you. Thanks for joining the conference. It means a great deal. Um, again, our, our thoughts and prayers go out to President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people in this incredibly difficult time. But as you said, their heroism is, is a testament to, to the amazing people that live there who want to live in freedom. That's all it is. Yep. They just want to be free, and we can embrace that. Sir, thank you. All right, David. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.